Hey y'all, welcome back to The Hack Shack. Today we're delving deep into the nitty gritty of our home fiber internet journey. If you've been following along so far, you know we recently took the leap into a blazing fast two gig symmetrical service. But oh boy, the road to high speed paradise wasn't without its twists and turns. So buckle up as we navigate through the challenges and triumphs of upgrading our internet game. So as we talked about in the previous video, when I did the early bird sign up back in 2023, what I signed up for was one gig symmetrical service. And not too long after I did that, I made two purchases. One was for a 10 gig switch and the other was for a fiber capable firewall. Now, real quick, let me tell you about the specs of this particular machine. These are as they were given from the original manufacturer. So, you know, those uh, traffic numbers and things take with a grain of salt. This one has the G3420 CPU. It has six copper gigabit ports and two SFP ports. It's got two sticks of four gig ECC memory and has a four gig CF card. Now in hindsight, I'm not sure why I thought I needed to have a fiber capable firewall as I think most residential handoffs are some form of copper, no matter what. I ordered this surplus WatchGuard M500 firewall after checking that it could run PFSense. I saw where some folks had success with this one and I knew when I ordered it, the SFP ports were not 10 gig SFP plus ports. The reason I ordered a 10 gig switch originally was that I had thoughts of upgrading my NAS and I wanted to be able to have a bit faster storage access for my main editing station, which I also envisioned making 10 gig capable. These items arrived and I promptly did nothing with them. I just set them in storage and almost forgot about them. My original plan was just to get this all going around the time the fiber would actually be installed. And at some point between the first sign up and the actual service installation, I got an email that offered one year of two gig symmetrical service for the price of one gig. And I said yes to that offer. Quite a bit of time passed and I didn't get the install scheduling call until late January, 2024. At some point, I ended up mixing up the 10 gig access switch along with the firewall purchase. And in my head, I somehow thought that was 10 gig capable and didn't think I'd have a problem getting two gig service. I tried to gather up all my stuff to get it ready because I didn't want to miss an early install time. So I went ahead and scheduled it for February 2nd, 2024, even though I knew I wouldn't have everything ready to go. The install came and went, and I did some things to verify I was actually getting two gig speeds, see previous video. However, I quickly realized not long after opening up this firewall package that this model did not have 10 gig ports. A few different scenarios went through my head. I thought I could slice up a separate outside VLAN on my new 10 gig switch and then essentially have my outside firewall logical interface be a port channel or lag, that kind of thing. I won't argue it here in the comments, but I knew that if I did that, I'd never actually see over one gig to the internet from my workstation. Collectively, things could combine to get that two gig in aggregate, but not a single flow. I knew I could look for some kind of hacky solution or just go back to one gig, which is maybe what I should have done to begin with. From checking on the forums, I came across a few things where folks mentioned that the motherboards had a reverse card edge style PCIe 8X connection. If you notice in this photo of an M570, unlike the 400 or 500, it has a module slot there on the right. This is where various things can be plugged in, including a 10 gig capable module. Now my firewall didn't have that, but it did have the motherboard connection for that. How this normally looks is like this. You can see the edge connector goes into this other connector that makes a turn and essentially is the interface for the card to slide into. My machine didn't have that slot mechanism or the special connector. It appears I wasn't the first person to wonder about making use of this connector in other ways though. Look at this photo where you can see someone using a standard 10 gig card plugged in with an extension cable. I started searching in earnest to find some kind of PCIe female to female adapter. I found this one on eBay and I ordered it up as well as this extension cable and a PCIe dual port SFP plus NIC. This type is an Intel 520 model. I planned to use this originally with some RJ45 10 gig copper adapters. With the adapter coming from China, I knew it'd be a while. So I went ahead and started looking at the software install for the firewall. This firewall still had the original software on it. I connected up my serial console cable and poked around a bit, but then removed the CF card from the firewall. I 
put this card in my PC and made an image of the original contents on the off chance I would want to play with them later. I then made a switch and decided to use OpenSense instead of PFSense. I've been wanting to try it out for a while and figured there's no time like the present. OpenSense forked from PFSense some years ago and it seems to have a decent user base and following. I'll provide some links for you to learn more if you'd like. Way back in the day, I started out using IP Masquerade on Linux to get home networks online, even with shared dial-up before cable modems and things like that. Later on, I switched to using PFNAT with OpenBSD, and then I had some experience with a project called MonoWall that used some nice firewalls based on the Socris platform. What is neat is that MonoWall is what PFSense and OpenSense come from, and even the NAS I prefer to use, ZigmaNAS, makes use of the same lineage. Okay, enough with the history lesson. So I downloaded the serial version of OpenSense and put it on the CF card. I installed this back into the firewall and I also attached an SSD I'd purchased to one of the available SATA ports. The installer worked without any real issues and resulted in a fresh system that booted from the SSD after removing the CF card. Some folks that hack around on this platform do hack the BIOS, but I didn't really have a need to. I was able to boot and do what I wanted to do without it. I might look at doing that in the future, but I'll put links to the forum post that talk about that in the description. Quite a bit of time passed, but finally that female to female PCIe adapter arrived. I combined this with a PCIe extension cable and the Intel card and the copper 10 gig SFPs, and I started doing some initial testing. Things did not work initially, but this was due to the SFP modules not being quote unquote correct or supported ones or Intel ones. I have experienced this before in the networking world, and I even have a whole video dedicated to that topic and tinkering with these values. After a quick search, I found out what was needed to be put where to allow the non-standard modules to work. The interfaces then showed up as expected and started working. I tested things directly from the firewall and from a test PC that went through the firewall, but never for any extended period of time. Things seemed to be working. Now what I did notice was that the copper 10 gig modules got extremely hot like too hot to hold hot. I'm not joking. In my day job, I've never used these. We always use optical connectors or DAC cables. I knew these used more power and thus likely generated more heat, but I had no idea they got this hot. Once I realized how hot these things got and how this NIC card would be sandwiched inside the actual case and not poking out like a normal switch, I decided to punt and go with optical 10 gig SFPs. But when I made that call, I had to account to get from the copper to fiber since my ONT from the provider only has a copper handoff. And so to do that, I ordered this adapter. And this doesn't make the copper SFP any cooler, but it does expose it and it gets more airflow this way. So this works, but it does introduce another point of failure between the ONT and the firewall, but it is what it is. Once this converter arrived, I cabled things up with two fiber 10 gig SFPs and tested a bit. I didn't do any extended testing this time, but things seemed okay. So, okay, now trigger warning. You're about to see me start drilling on this case. If you have a problem with that, you might want to look away or skip this section. Back even when I thought I was going to use the copper connections, I wanted to have, you know, the outside look as clean as possible, even though the inside might have been a mess. And I was going to use these RJ45 panel connector coupler things. Of course, now with the switch to fiber, I had to order some of these. Now to use these, I had to drill a couple of holes in the front of the case. This is not enterprise, this is my house. I would never say do anything like this for a business or something. I used my calipers to kind of make some measurements and get a general idea of where I wanted them to be. I used a center punch to make some starting points. Now I should have taken this motherboard out of the case when I did this, but I didn't. I covered it up a bit and put some tape and some with the sticky side out to try to catch as much debris as possible, fully planning to tilt things over and vacuum it out afterwards. I'm going to use various drill bits and in increasing sizes and a step bit at the final part to make the correct size holes. And this is what I ended up with. Oh my goodness, there's no going back now, is there? I then started doing some testing that was a bit more extended with a PC streaming YouTube in several windows at once combined with the occasional speed test from the test box as well as the firewall itself. This is where some frustration started happening. Many times I could leave and return back to the network traffic being stopped. The firewall wasn't locked up or anything. I could reboot it and things would start working again. Sometimes I could seemingly trigger it myself or it would happen in a random amount of time. I then started looking at the output of netstat-i when the firewall was in this state. And I observed insanely high error counts on these interfaces. 
I removed the couplers as a first guess, but that still didn't fix things. Random hangups with tons of errors still occurred. I then found some things online talking about when using this kind of card and a device that's doing routing, you may have to disable all this built-in offloading stuff that it has. So I found where to do that in the interface, and I'll pop up here the way that you do it on the command line too, just so you know. And once I did that, things started testing clean for hours at a time. I tried my best to get it to break and nothing seemed to phase it. So I let that thing run for multiple days to make sure that it was okay and didn't get one error, zero, that's it. So the offload stuff must've been the issue because it's been running clean ever since. I put the panel connectors back in line and I thought I'd be one step closer to this firewall being in action. The last thing I did was install this new PCIe extender cable. The other one seemed to be working without any trouble, but this new one looked to be of a much higher quality. So I put it in its place and stuffed all that stuff back in there. Would I like to have this connected in a better, more secure way? Sure. However, with it stuffed in there like this, it's not going anywhere, especially sitting still in my rack. So final thoughts. Number one, would I do this again? I'm not sure. This is the third WatchGuard appliance that I've repurposed with PFSense, or in this case, OpenSense, and I've enjoyed having them and I like them. Here's the thing, all this trouble and stuff, and if I end up going back to one gig, well, I mean, it's been an exercise. I've learned stuff, right? So it's positive in that way, but just because something's rack mounted, it's like this rack mount tax. I don't know if it's worth it. Even though I've got my rack here, I could get a shelf to put in there and one could get a one of those small form factor off lease corporate type PCs and you could put the same kind of nick in there and get the same end result for probably cheaper and certainly less headache, but it wouldn't be rack mountable and it wouldn't be one you. You gotta decide if that's worth the trouble for you. One thing I am interested in is trying to run 2.5 gig on one of these copper devices that I've got. The SFPs I have will do that, but the NIC I've got, that Intel 520 is too old to do that. So one day, maybe if I get a new enough NIC that will support like me manually saying, hey, only do 2.5 gig auto, it would negotiate with the ONT over here and I hear that when they're running at 2.5, they run much, much cooler and that would get rid of that. And I wouldn't have to have that little adapter box in between being another single point of failure. Now, I don't know if these folks would support it, but I've also seen these SFPs that are like ONTs on a stick. And it presents like a 10 gig interface to the device you plug it into. But on its other side, where it's got just the one fiber con single mode connection, it, will, uh, it does all its stuff and it gives you all the stuff that's in that ONT box inside the optic. That would be interesting. Or if I could even get an ONT that has a fiber handoff possibly. I don't know if those are out there. I need to go look and see. That would be nice. I would like to get that little adapter box out of the mix eventually because it's just something to break in my opinion. And that's all I gotta say about that, I guess. Hey, if you made it this far, thanks for watching and I hope to see you again next time. Take care, bye-bye.